I'm Mark Weber of the Computer History Museum, and I'm here with graphics and hypertext pioneer Andy Van Dam. Today is December 10th, 2008, and first I want to thank you for sitting down with me and talking about your work. Sure, my pleasure. Um, I just want really to start at the beginning and give a little bit of background. Uh, where did you grow up and what got you interested in computing? How far back do you want to go in the question of where did I grow up? Uh, I immigrated from the Netherlands where I was born in 52, had three years of schooling on Cape Cod, did my college and graduate work in Pennsylvania and then moved back to New England and uh, have held only one job since with a couple of exceptions for sabbaticals. That's been at Brown University since 1965. And you went to Swarthmore? I went to Swarthmore as an undergraduate where I met Ted Nelson. In fact, freshman week. And you played frisbee together, I believe. Frisbee, we had spirited arguments. We uh, had a uh, shared interest in theater. He produced the world's first rock musical. And my wife, who at the time was my girlfriend, and I had bit parts in that show. And, uh, then I reconnected with Ted after we were, uh, in my case, I was out of grad school and already teaching, and he was working on his hypertext ideas, and they later crystallized in Xanadu. And so you were familiar from the beginning with some of those ideas from meeting him? Well, from the beginning, for me, it was 1967 when I met him at a okay. computer conference, and we saw each other and decided to catch up and I learned about this idea that he had and uh, at that time I had taken possession of a real treasure which was an IBM 2250 display which we had gotten because of the close connection between Brown University and T.J. Watson who graduated from Brown and so we were very fortunate to be able to get one of those very expensive displays and uh, even though the display was for doing research in graphics, uh, Ted convinced me that there was an exciting possibility of looking at hypertext and how that might be implemented. And uh, so I did a bootleg project, which became the hypertext editing system. So when you knew him at Swarthmore, he may have had ideas, but he didn't discuss. Them. No, I, I had no knowledge of these ideas of is about how information should be organized, stored, retrieved, and so on. And uh, had you read the Bush article, as we may think? Or no, I had book? not. Okay. No, that didn't come till later. And graphics, you were, went, describe your early interest in what got you into computer graphics? What got me hooked and uh, effectively was a life-changing experience for me is watching the Sketchpad movie. And I saw that, had an epiphany, and said, okay, that's what I got to do with the rest of my life. Now, pictures weren't exactly foreign to me. I had worked on uh, character recognition already in 1960, fresh out of college, as part of a uh, summer job at Burroughs Research Center in Paoli, Pennsylvania. I worked with the great C.K. Chow as his apprentice. He was one of the world's expert in character recognition. And I'd also been interested in how one could represent simple two-dimensional images. And I had done a master's thesis on a blueprint repository using aperture cards. Aperture cards are uh, IBM cards, as they became known, but punched cards, 80-column punched cards with a slot in them where you inserted a piece of microfilm so that you could store digital information along with the analog image. And there was a huge repository of blueprints in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, among other places. Uh, it's how the Navy kept all their documentation and made it machine searchable. And I did a uh, master's thesis on how you could do Boolean keyword retrieval. On when you say digital. Aperture cards. Well, they had punched columns, so you right. could have uh, alphanumeric information but keys, in particular, stored with the microfilm. 
But then the microfilm, of course, would be an image. So you would the microfilm digital was an image, right. and I think uh, the, the columns of digital information that you had available were purely for identifying the, uh, the image and maybe having a few simple keywords. Metadata. Metadata, metadata is what we okay. would call it today, exactly right. So I, I'd always been interested in things visual. I did the usual high school photography yearbook photographer so imagery to me was a was a cool thing so when I saw somebody manipulating images on a screen in real time in a world that for me at the time and for everybody else consisted of feeding decks of punched cards to computers and uh, where, that was just mind-blowing where were you when you saw that I was a graduate student at the University and I don't even remember how I came to see the, the movie but as I said, it changed my life. I decided I had to do something about uh, manipulating imagery. Unfortunately, we didn't have a display. We barely had a computer that we had access to. In fact, sidebar, my first programming course, uh, we didn't even get our hands on a computer. Everything was hand-checked. Computers were uh, hard to come by in the early 60s. So. Uh, to loop back to the event in 1967, I had then, for the first time, a real live interactive display. I'd written about interactive displays and other imaging technology in my thesis, and I had worked on data structures for representing two-dimensional images, but I hadn't actually been able to do it all in real time on a display. We uh, simulated output on a line printer. And was amazingly hokey <laughs> compared to what we have access to today, but those were the early days. Anyhow, so being able to get my hands on a tube and have it in my lab and accessible 24 hours a day, if I could get the machine time, which was not so easy, uh, that was a real thrill. And that was a very expensive display. Yeah, I think it was on the order of a quarter of a million dollars, which by yeah. today's standards would be several million dollars. You know, 1967 money. Ten times inflation, roughly, I think. Yeah, something like that. And the uh, mainframe, which at that time was 512K, was uh, probably a million dollars or more. And essentially, uh, we had to sign up for time, typically third shift, to be able to run the tube. But then after a while, we were able to run it in a partition of a... Uh, uh, a multi-programmed system, a multi-programmed operating system. And when eventually time-sharing became sort of the standard way of hooking peripherals. When you had the epiphany with the movie, I mean, did you have to change what you were doing completely? Well, uh, I hadn't been entirely sure whether I would continue with information retrieval or do something quite different, and it came at a moment when I should have made a decision anyhow, so then the decision came to try to understand how you represent pictorial information, and that's what the Sketchpad thesis was about to a large extent, but I thought there were other things that could be done, and I used a different approach than Ivan had used for Sketchpad. What were some of those other things? Well, that's actually an interesting part of the story because I used a, what was called an associative memory system or simulator called Multilist, which was a, uh, a simple but effective simulation of associative memory of the type that it was thought we had in our brains, a la Bush, associative trails. So what this allowed you to do is to have lists, a list per keyword, and when you tagged a object of some kind with, say, half a dozen keywords, it would appear on the keyword lists for each keyword, and then in the simulator you would be able, essentially, to tug on the threads that represented those lists and get the intersection of all of those terms. So what would come back would be the item that appeared on all six lists if you 
specified a keyword retrieval of six items, six the keywords. common denominator of association. In association. Yeah, so uh, effectively it was an and of those six keywords. So it, I, I won't claim to uh, have any let, let's say any responsibility for the associative memory simulator. I didn't implement that. I was a user of it. And I figured I could use that kind of representation to, uh, to store images. And so that's what my thesis was about mostly. So purely image to image with no words. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Two-dimensional line drawings. Okay. So didn't deal with 3D, but I did deal, for example, with how you transform sub-images to create compositions of, of images or objects, really, uh, in the same way that Sketchpad did that. That was the major contribution of Sketchpad, if you ignore the hardware. that He designed these data structures that let you have hierarchies of components hierarchies and sub-hierarchies sort of indefinitely down. So I found a different way of representing them using this multi-list idea. But graphics primitives and then sketchpad models? Well, or? graphics primitives uh, and you combine primitives to make what we would call graphic objects today. And you sort of build from the bottom up and make ever more complicated assemblies. Which was your the, the key sketchpad idea. So I had a different way of representing things, but in many ways it, it duplicated the key ideas of sketchpad. And so this was your doctorate work then? Yeah. And I also described a number of uh, technologies that I thought would be important for image storage and retrieval, including such things as plasma displays, which I had just been learning about and which I was given to understand would probably arrive on the scene within five to ten years. It took a lot longer before we had plasma displays. Where did you see them? I, don't, I forget where I learned about them. But I uh, made a lot of phone calls and did a lot of social engineering to get state-of-the-art information about what people were working on. And that was another very descriptive part of my thesis. And so you were not computer science as an academic department didn't exist. Well, actually, point. yes, I was. Uh, Penn was arguably um, the first school to have a PhD track in what was called computer and information sciences. And my good friend uh, to this day, Dick Wexelblad, and I, and a number of other people were the first enrollees in that PhD program. Dick got his PhD in 65. I left in 65 to go to Brown and finished up my dissertation while at Brown by commuting to Penn and getting machine time at 3 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, commuting? Got my, wow. Yeah, a kind of commuting. And uh, finished up the degree in 66. So he and I have the first two PhDs in a doctoral program that specifically was identified with computing. There were earlier PhDs, of course, in numerical analysis and various other precursors to modern computer science, but they weren't given by programs specifically called computer or anything. And similar to a computer science program today or very different? Oh, you could see that it was uh, embryonic. But in particular, when I got to Brown, I found that most of the material that I had learned I couldn't really use except for some of the fundamental logical design and switching theory. Uh, the stuff I learned about languages and uh, translation techniques really wasn't state of the art anymore. So my first few years, I had to learn a lot of new stuff so that I could then teach it. And I worked a huge amount with undergraduates who were learning this material with me. And, and then we would sort of teach each other and then we would give it to the class. So uh, the classes in those days got research results almost from the get-go. And why did you go to Brown? 
Ah, that's a circuitous story in and of itself. So you want me to tell the, the story? My wife, before we had twins, uh, was a high school teacher in the local high school. She taught French, and she belonged to the NEA, National Education Association. And they have a magazine, and I read that magazine uh, just leafing through it, and there was an article about a guy named George Grossman who in the New York City school system, it might have been Bronx High School of Science, but I don't remember that, was teaching his high school kids about computing and teaching them to program. And at first, I, being a thorough skeptic then and still, said, oh, come on, no way. I'm learning this as a graduate student. How can you possibly teach that stuff to high school kids? But after the first reaction went away and I started actually thinking about whether it was feasible, I came to the conclusion that, well, of course you could do that. It didn't involve a lot of physics or higher mathematics. It was logical and logic, and there really wasn't any reason that you couldn't teach it to high school students. And that led me to the idea of maybe offering a few hours of instruction to a few of Debbie's brightest students. And that seemed like a lot of work for very little return, so the scope and ambition kept growing. And to cut to the chase, I mounted a full summers program for high school students and high school teachers together that involved both some suburban schools, including Debbie's, and uh, some schools in the Philadelphia School District. There were about 30 high school teachers and students. We published the results. It was a gas just the most fun I'd had in a long time, and it changed my mind about what my career path should be. I had no intention of going into academia. My father had taught college, taught biology to pre-meds, and so I knew I wasn't going to do biology and I wasn't going to go into teaching. Uh, but uh, I had so much fun teaching this course in 1962 that uh, decided that I should go to academe. Okay, so I'm close to finishing my dissertation, or not so close as it turns out, in the fall of 65, and I get a call from a graduate of that program, Jim Castellan, and he calls me up and he says, hey, did you know there is an opening at Brown? And I said, well, no, I didn't, but I've all but accepted a job at University of Maryland, so it's kind of too late. But to do... To Maryland would have been to, to, to teach yeah. to teach computer science. So I said, "Ah, you got to come to Brown." And I said, "Why?" And he said, "Because Brown really believes in undergraduates and undergraduate teaching." And he knew I'd had a wonderful time at Swarthmore, and I really appreciated the intimate contact with faculty and small classes and the whole liberal arts college experience. And he knew I wasn't very happy as a graduate student at Penn because it was large and impersonal and it was a commuting school and a lot of reasons. So uh, he said, you would really fit well at Brown. So I decided, all right, what the hell, I'll invest one day. So I spent a day, I was met by one of the uh, senior faculty member at the airport picked me up. I interviewed with the chairman of the department who excused himself in the middle of the interview to go teach a freshman course. And I said, aha, they mean it. And you, being a Brown graduate, know that Brown takes undergraduate teaching very seriously. Uh, yep. At Penn at that time, I mean, this is a very different Penn from the Penn of today. You could tell the rank of a faculty member by what level course they taught. Assistant professors uh, did not have contact um, with uh, freshmen necessarily, but certainly senior faculty didn't. They taught the advanced courses. And Maryland would have been similar. And presumably. Maryland, my guess is, would have been similar. But here, the department chairman taught freshmen, and that would never have happened at Penn. Even at Swarthmore. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. The, at Swarthmore, the departments were sufficiently small that everybody taught. Nobody was just a, an administrator. 
And what was the department at Brown? It was applied math. Good question. So, and the other thing that convinced me to go to Brown is they had this wonderful Gorky tapestry in their computing lab. And the computing lab was just new then. And I thought, wow, any place that hangs a Gorky in a, in a computing lab, that's, that's a touch of class I really like. Plus, I love New England, having grown up at least on this side of the ocean in Woods Hole and Falmouth. So there were a number of reasons that made me go to Brown. And fortunately, I made the right decision, and I've been there ever since. But it's kind of a funky chain of coincidences that got me into teaching and then got me through that teaching, in particular to go to Brown, where Jim was my student and his wife-to-be was my student and my teaching assistant. So uh, that's a fun story. And your wife continued doing education? No. After the twins was born, were oh. born, she uh, stopped being an educator. And the position at Brown was for computer science? They hired me knowing that I was a computer scientist, not an applied mathematician, and that I wanted to set up a computer science department. It took a lot longer than I thought it would. And eventually, uh, some folks in engineering and some folks in applied math got together and over a period of years convinced the administration that they should let their people go. So we. Uh, but the person that hired you knew that they were potentially. He hired me because they yeah. wanted to have a real computer scientist. And uh, Brown was one of the very first schools to teach computer science to undergraduates. So by 66, there were several tracks in applied math. There were the traditional, was the traditional applied math track, and then there were people who were working with me and subsequently other faculty who were hired who took some applied math, but their courses were primarily in computer science. And this was at a time when all the top schools, the ones with good graduate departments, said, no, 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 that's premature specialization. An undergraduate may take a programming course, but we're certainly not going to give lots of specialized courses at the undergraduate level. And they didn't move from that point of view until the 80s or 90s for some of the top schools. So Brown had been doing it since the late 60s. And that accounts, by the way, for the fact that there are a very n large number of influential folks in the computer industry who started out when they were undergraduates, did research with me, were teaching assistants with me, and have really made an indelible mark on the industry. So Brown specialized in undergraduates since 66, I can say. You were, I mean, Brown was the first or second? To, to do them. undergraduates? I, you know, I've not tracked that history. Okay. There might have been another place, but I certainly can't come up with one. CMU did not, Stanford did not, MIT did not, Cornell did not, uh, Berkeley did not. They started their undergraduate programs much later. They started with graduate programs that had been well underway uh, by the time that uh, I started the undergraduate program. And so. You finished your PhD, and then that was on the graphics, the associative yes, model. Yes, using described. the associative memory simulation to do 2D graphics. But right. doing all of this without an actual display. That's right. Using a line printer for output, and there was no interactive input. So getting the 2250 was growing up and moving from the tricycle era to a, a motorbike in one fell swoop. And you had twins at this point. Yeah, I, uh, one of the good family stories is that the weekend we arrived, my wife and I were typing our dissertation on typewriters with the twins lying on a couch all through the night. And that was the first of many all-nighters all through the year. So yes, that was a bit hairy that first year, especially when the kids were small and I was commuting to Philadelphia. And, establishing brand new courses that I'd never taught before and for which I still had to learn the material, getting the research research group started, helping to lobby for the 2250 and getting people to start working with it and so on. 
but it was fun. It was really great fun. And the year after that, I went to uh, see Doug Engelbart's show. But 67 is when... When I met Ted Nelson. Ted again. And when some undergraduates and I started working with Ted as advisor, consultant, requirement setter, inspirer. Uh, and where was to Ted at the time? Doug was at no, SRI. Sorry. Ted, when you met him. Ted, I think, was living with his grandfather still. So he was commuting, and we didn't have any money to pay him. So but he from did New this. Jersey from New Jersey, probably, yeah. yeah. And you or it might him. have been from New York. I, I really don't remember. And, uh, but where did you, you told me you met him at? I met him at, I believe, the Spring Joint Computer Conference. Okay. In those days, Spring was typically on the East Coast, and Fall Joint Computer Conference was on the West Coast. And how was he regarded by the computer scientists? They thought he was pretty weird pretty far out there. He had all these wild and crazy ideas and uh, the collaboration was not always easy and as you know Ted was ultimately very disappointed in what we produced because it didn't resemble the Xanadu vision in, in any way that he would recognize. Uh, for us it was our first pancake that we couldn't have done anything more ambitious with the resources that we had and the knowledge that we had. So I still think it was a very good first effort, but we threw out most of the design and the ideas for the second system that we implemented without Ted's input. The first was Hess. First was the hypertext was editing system, Hess, and uh, the paper first. that as Carmody, who was an undergraduate at the time, and Ted and me as the authors, describes it quite well. And then came Fress, file retrieval and editing system. It's a pun. We thought the system uh, was a fresser in Yiddish and that it consumed, oh my God, 128K of memory in one of the partitions of this uh, multitasking operating system. And that was an immense amount of memory. You know, it was a 512K machine, so to use up 128K partition, it was a memory hog, hence the pun. And so, Ted was coming, you were developing this. During with the hypertext editing system days, right. So and at, the, at that point, you knew nothing about what was going on at SRI. I had no knowledge of SRI. Uh, Ted had known of Engelbart, I believe, but we certainly didn't discuss it. And I'm not so sure when he learned about what Engelbart was up to. I don't even remember when we read the Bush paper for the first time. So the first system was completely inspired by Ted's ideas, and we tried to cut them down to size to the point where we thought we could implement them, which is the source of the profound disappointment that Ted has experienced ever since, that we realized so little of his vision. But I'm, as I said earlier, I'm still proud of what we got done in a very small amount of time. So by the time I saw the mother of all demos in 68, probably more than anyone else in the audience, I appreciated the, the breath, the breathtaking breath of, of Doug's vision and what he and his group had pulled off. And uh, as Doug himself says on, the, on one of the web pages that describes this, I, I was very skeptical and believe that some of it must have been demo wear, where, you know, the man behind the curtain, <laughs> etc. And so he was very, very kind and said, well, come up to uh, my lab and we'll show you how it's done. And they opened the kimono, as it was called many years later, in Silicon Valley, and uh, essentially gave me access to all of the technology and how they had done it. And I wound up writing up the, the, the system aspects, the algorithms and data structures that they used to do much of the uh, manipulations that he demoed in 68. And I did that as part of a paper that compared and contrasted their way of doing it with lots of other ways, including our own in both Hess and Fress. And what were the key differences? 
the key differences were that um, he was very hierarchy oriented. So everything in NL NLS is a statement. And those statements had 4,000 character limits, which were not unreasonable given the severe memory constraints of the time. But Ted had always insisted that we weren't going to have lines and we weren't going to have statements. Uh, there were some program editors that had, you know, like 512 character strings. Uh, he wanted completely free form and arbitrary length strings, and I agreed that that was a a good way to think, and I didn't even really think about hierarchy until I saw NLS. So, so in Fress, what we did is to combine Ted's idea of arbitrary length strings with optional hierarchy that you could superimpose on the strings. And we copied the view specs idea, and we had keyworded access down to the character level if you wanted that. But we preserved a, a lot of the freer nature of uh, hypertext editing system. We also made links bidirectional and kept NL them fine grained. NLS links were bidirectional, weren't they? Um, mm -hmm. I don't recall whether the NLS links were bidirectional. You could certainly go back. And we had that also in the hypertext editing system. But there's a difference between bidirectional links where you can always see who's pointing to you and being able to reverse a trail. And you had a database of links? We did not have a separate database of links in those systems. That is one of the things that Norm Meyerowitz, who designed the Intermedia system as its principal architect, uh, developed as a novel idea that you separate out the link structure from the raw content so that you could have multiple link structures over the same content. Not, uh, none of NLS, HESS, or FRESS would have been able to do that. So the link was broken. There was no obvious check except to try it. Um, well, uh, I guess the only way a, a link would be broken is if the the destination would somehow have been deleted, and uh, yeah, that would give you an error. But I believe that in Fress, if you touched a piece of text that was being linked to, we would go back and essentially make the link pointing to that, or any links pointing to that, invalid, because you had the information who was pointing to you. So if the anchor for the link went away, then we could go back into the, the page structure and delete the forward pointers to that point. So I don't think it was possible to get a okay. 404. And the, so tell about how this fit in with your, with your graphics work. Oh, well, it didn't, is the answer. So Hess was a complete bootleg project. And it was done spare time uh, by these undergraduates who were having a ball learning how to do this kind of stuff. And who were the main people? Uh, Steve Carmody, and he is still at Brown. And he uh, does various kinds of sort of uh, technology work in the computing center. At one point, was the head of the computing center. And I don't remember now who else worked on Hess. I have a better memory of who all worked on Fress, which was quite a sizable group, including Bob Wallace, who was one of the co-founders of Microsoft and the inventor of shareware, and died, unfortunately, prematurely. Uh, so Hess was a bootleg project, but eventually I showed it to our program monitor, Sam Matza, and convinced Sam that this kind of use of a expensive graphics terminal uh, could lead to something useful that we could perhaps influence uh, Time Magazine and uh, the New York Times. And think about having their editors enter their stories online and edit them and 
see the changes in real time instead of phoning them in. Remember, this is before even acoustic couplers and editors did not sit at terminals in those days. And so we demoed at the time Life Building, once Sam and IBM became reconciled to the fact that we'd sort of bootlegged this little project. They actually were excited about it. And for about six months, Sam and his right-hand man, Don Rooley, at the IBM New York Scientific Center, which I think was on Fifth Avenue, but I'm not entirely sure. And Ted and I, on our end, were going to go into business together to create a version of hypertext editing system slash fresh slash Xanadu uh, that we would try to flog commercially. We went as far as to talk to a virtual, uh, a venture capitalist. But uh, in the words of the old limerick, we argued all night as to who had the right to do what with which and to whom. And, uh, eventually, the venture fell apart, and uh, Ted and I went our own separate ways. But to hook back to another part of the story, Sam at that time was very involved in ACM and thought at some point he might like to be the the chairman or the director of, of ACM. And he was very involved with the idea of having ACM put on professional development seminars. And he and Jim Adams, who was a full-time employee of ACM, and I agreed that one of the very first should be on computer graphics. So Sam and I put on a set of events and various cities around the country in 67 and 68 uh, to bring graphics to people who were interested in getting a quick one-day introduction. I did most of the lecturing. Sam had one piece. Um, and that, in turn, led us to see that there was a lot of interest in graphics. We sometimes had as many as 80 to 100 people in a ballroom. So we then said, gee, you know, um, this seems to be some growing interest in computer graphics. It's not this narrow niche specialty anymore, practiced by a few people in aerospace and automobile <coughs> companies. Uh, maybe it's time to start a little professional activity. And that became sick graph special interest. You could say again the, the origins of sick graph. Yeah. So seeing that there was significant interest because of the professional development seminars, um, we then decided that we should have a little professional group within ACM. And uh, Sam was the chairman, and I was the secretary. But before we could even get that off the ground, uh, the ACM bylaws required that you be able to show that this was a field that had some promise by getting a mere 30 signatures. It was tough getting a 30, 30 signatures on that petition, because there weren't that many practitioners. There were people who were interested, but the number of people who were doing work in the area was tiny. This was a complete niche field when we started. And uh, we eventually got them. And this was a very low-key activity. We produced some newsletters at Brown using the hypertext editing system, uh, which I can't find, unfortunately. Um, and then nothing much happened until 74 when some other people established a conference, and that conference eventually became this monster event called SIGGRAPH, the SIGGRAPH Annual Conference, with all of its associated activities, its newsletters, and publications, and educational activities, and exhibition, which at one point had all of the giants in the industry, uh, and a huge amount of space with exhibits, and even today with uh, a shrinking 
field and economy, there are still 25 to 30,000 people who come every year. It's by far the largest group under ACM sponsorship. Now, most of those people are not doing research. The number of graphics researchers or people who are interested in graphics research is probably five, six, seven thousand. They go to the technical program. Most people come from the exhibition and the art show and so on. So there's a little bit of a disconnect between what Sam and I formed in the late 60s and the formation of SIGGRAPH as we know it today, and other people get the credit for that. But when you say nothing much happened between 68 and 74, it continued to meet. Not really. No. no it was more a virtual organization. There was a chapter in L.A. because there was a lot of uh, aerospace industry in L.A. But I, I would say it was fairly virtual as, as an organization. But it continued to exist. People it continued to exist, certainly legally, uh, in terms of the ACM bylaws. And at some point, it was converted to be SIG graph with a G as in group. But why was it SIG? SIG, uh, I think you started as a committee, and then you became a group when your activities warranted it. Unfortunately, that's a bit of the history that uh, I don't have anymore. Sam might, Jim Adams might, don't know. But, but to come back to another thread, which is the trying to convince people that someday we would all sit behind screens and author. So you were circling back from yeah. SIGGRAPH. Right. So that was the SIGGRAPH story. Uh, now back to the hypertext story. So through Sam Matz's connection at Time Life and the New York Times, we uh, exhibited, uh, we did a demo in the Time Life building, and we had people from the New York Times come to Brown, and Ted had constructed a very nice web of electroplating patents and had done essentially the information architecture, and that was our standard demo. Electroplating patents. patents. Yeah, but they're cross-references. So there was a sort of hierarchical way of coming down, or you could be in any one and see links to others. And for the time, it was quite an elaborate little web. And we very carefully thought about ways through it, and we knew how to demo it. And the reaction, uh, I remember well enough as, wow, this is really interesting but it's too futuristic for us. Uh, editors in front of expensive screens, um, not so likely. Well, I believe Newsday in Long Island had editors behind ATEX time-sharing system screens in 76. So less than a decade after we were told we were way too far into the future. And what had to happen is that the cost had to come down. We were still running on a very expensive display connected to a very expensive mainframe. And what the ATEX people did was to use a mini computer and use very cheap displays. They were very much less powerful than what we had in terms of their functional capability, but correspondingly uh, also easier to understand. In the hypertext editing system, um, we had a function keypad with 32 keys and overlays, which could be sensed by the computer. So what we did is we had effectively two sets of functions. One were for editing, one was for formatting. And I learned very quickly that when I had uh, an overlay labeled with 31 functions, people's eyes would glaze over. And so what I did is I made overlays where the buttons were hidden except for the middle row, which was just <coughs> insert, delete, move, delete, uh, and yeah, insert, delete, move, and maybe one more. And I would show that with the light pen, how you indicated a text string, and then push the button to have something done. But the light pen was light pen was the mouse pointer. equivalent. That was the pointer exactly, and uh, 
after they mastered that, then I would say effectively, but wait, there's more, and then bring up the next overlay, which would expose another set of functions. How would they add, add a link, for instance? Uh, there was a insert link, effectively. And, and, then sure. and then you bend the explainer on the link. So typed links. And that, uh, no, you didn't type them in. You had to make them no, but I mean, ranked by them. specifying source and destination. And by the way, that was one of the good things that, that uh, Doug's team invented. In, certainly in the hypertext editing system and in Fresh, you couldn't type your links in. You had to indicate them by direct manipulation. You had to show the source and the destination and then specify either before or after. I, I've forgotten exactly. I think probably in prefix mode. So first the command and then the source and destination. And then we would fix up the data structure to record that link. In Doug's case, you could actually type the names of statements, the labels of statements, and that would establish the link with a special command. So it was a better design because you could edit the link as if it were normal text. You couldn't do that in our systems. But his links could be, have a, um, they were not all simple association. It could be defined as like, this link is to a definition or this link is to. Well, at, at some point you could add <coughs> few specs to links. I don't know whether that was present in the 68 demo already. So in Fress, we had view specs with links, we had keywords with links, so you could be quite fine-grained about your control of what a particular user of the system would see. And we had other kinds of links that were completely hidden so that you could splice things together without having to explicitly link to go from one place to another. So we distinguished between jumps and links. Uh, sorry, jumps and splices. So the splice was hidden, so how would yeah. it manifest itself? Uh, you would simply move from one to the other smoothly, and uh, there must have been a view spec in which you could actually see the splices, but that would have been a sort of editor's view spec. A reader would have jumped seamlessly from one to the next so that you could splice together. And to what extent was there text editing on computers at this time? Oh, there wasn't. No. Oh, no. So no, is no, it no. accurate that both you and Doug essentially... We had the first word processors in effect. What people had was line editors and Butler Lamson's QED, which was a more powerful line editor because it wasn't just restricted to single lines. I think he went up to 512 characters. This is all, uh, I wrote that all up in several papers. Uh, in any case, it's, it's clear that people used uh, text editors, uh, program text editors for producing documentation. That was an obvious thing to do. But our systems had way more functionality for editing and they had hypertext linking. And uh, from the beginning, the hypertext editing system also was able to accept formatting codes and used IBM's Text 360 program to do nice printing on the line printer. So you could specify paragraphs and tabs and indents and stuff like that via the, the function keypad. How many lines could you see on the screen, roughly? Oh, quite a few lines, um, certainly 24. So it's accurate that you, well, you and Ted and Doug and his group independently and kind of came up with a word, different forms of word processing. Yeah, I think these were the forerunners of word processing. And, you know, this is one of the things that Ted was not interested in because one of the main points of, of his worldview was that hypertext by definition was not printable. It was meant to be authored and read on screens. But we had documentation needs, and I figured it was a splendid way to produce documentation, and I could kill two birds with one stone. So I violated the purity of his vision 
perverted it from his point of view by introducing all this extra stuff to be able to print things out. But we used hypertext in order to link things together and to assemble documents. Uh, we certainly did a lot of that with Fress and our user community, uh, faculty members at Brown and the humanities in particular, got very creative with few specs and macros and printing out their syllabi and producing books. So they were really happy that we had thought a lot about how to make hypertext useful for printing linear documents. And what did the studio relationship with Ted, the, the fact that you didn't stick to his vision? Well, it certainly was, was problematic during the design of the hypertext editing system, but since he didn't have an implementation team in a way he was stuck with us, we didn't do what he wanted us to do in many ways, but at least something got done. And I think for a while he too took pride in what we had accomplished, but I think he came to realize how little of his vision actually was shown by that first pancake implementation and uh, has disowned it since. In fact, incorrectly blames it for uh, the design of hypercard and other one-way linking primitive systems, which eventually led to the what he considers the damaged vision of, of URLs. And I, I've written him and told him that he's giving us way too much credit for having influenced the designers of Hypercard and other systems. And Tim Berners-Lee, the, that the first of all, we had two-way links by '68 in Fress. And uh, none of hypertext editing system fresh or even systems I produced afterwards were studied by the people who did note cards or hypercard or uh, any of the uh, follow-on systems. But it's one of the places where we disagree. But you stayed friends in that? Well, for a while we weren't friendly, but then at the uh, hypertext conference in 87, um, we made up, and uh, Ted gave wonderful talks at Brown and at the uh, Bush Symposium, which I ran in honor of the uh, 50th anniversary of As We May Think. He gave a wonderful talk, and then this is one of those things where you say the gods were vengeful. The morons at MIT, I had hired professionals at great expense because I knew I was going to have the creme de la creme of the computing and hypertext world there, and I didn't want to have amateur night with video recording. So I hired at great expense professionals, and they recorded over Ted's talk of all the people to pick. <laughs> but I have to say, in this particular instance, Ted did not have a hissy fit. He uh, clearly was very discomfited. I was beyond mortified. And he was a, a real gentleman. He gave the talk again. It was a different talk. Some of it was the same. Some of it was different. It was a terrific talk. And it's still available. So uh, he, he really was a pro with that. And, uh, We've had some conversations since then, uh, but recently uh, he's sort of gone back to a very bitter view of the hypertext editing system. I just read in his new book that's coming out what he has written, and it's sort of his old view about what a mistake it was and how it set the world on the wrong course. And he's wrong about that. And I will write him again, telling him about what a nice job he did uh, on this Engelbart celebration with his five-minute pitch and how I wish we could get beyond the past and uh, go back to having a normal, respectful relationship because I admire him and respect him enormously. He and Doug were the uh, two great visionaries after Bush. And in the at the time, when you, you formed the company, or you started to form a company around Fress, and that's Well, I wouldn't say around Fress, around some kind of hybrid 
of the ideas that we had implemented and new ideas. So it would have been a completely different system. And what year, roughly? Uh, 68, 69. But that's when you drifted apart yeah, with Ted. Yeah, right. Ted was not interested in continuing to work with us um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the four of us working together had not ha ended happily, and we agreed that there was no further point in uh, working together. And the four was you, Ted? Don Rui and his boss, Sam Matza, who at that time was still the director of the New York Scientific Center for IBM. But the three of you continued to Oh, pursue. Matza and I are still friends. Uh, most, most recently, he and his wife stayed at my house. Uh, we communicate with each other. He's been retired for many years, but um, yeah, that, that has been a, a great relationship. And then back to your day job, what was going on with graphics? Yeah, so the, the whole hypertext thing was definitely a passion after I had my taste with the, the first system and I continued working on it. Um, and the, the two strands started merging, that is the hypertext strand and the graphics strand because Fress did have simple line graphics capabilities. Uh, but then the next system was the um, electronic document system, which we wrote up in transactions of graphics in the early 80s. And it was all about graphics with very little text. And uh, it was meant to allow people to construct online maintenance and repair manuals and other kinds of technical documentation where we, you would use the hypertext capabilities to make different trails through the, uh, the documents depending upon your need, depending upon keyword settings, your background, uh, whether you had been through those pages before, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they were, for the first time, taking advantage of what was then a new technology, color, raster graphics. So we have beautiful full color images of uh, sonar documents that we modeled in our system. And uh, we uh, worked with folks at Raytheon who are in the sonar business. So all of our examples came from the, the world of sonar electronics. Let's pause for an instant. So you were linking images to images. Linking images to images with minimal text and trying to make visualizations of the directed graph that hypertext makes, uh, trying to have conditional paths based on whether you'd visited a particular site before. So there are a number of user interface innovations. We built the modeling system for creating the images. Um, so. This was the system that Randy Pausch worked on and where he learned the fine art of demoing and spieling that stood him in such good stead. And he implemented uh, a bunch of things in the system and he was, as I said at his uh, eulogy, for his eulogy at his memorial service at CMU earlier this fall, that. He was the first person in our group who really was passionate about the user experience and wanted us to really focus not so much on the functionality but on exactly what the user would be able to do and how to express it and how things would be displayed. And he was really good at that. And Norm Meyerowitz also worked on Norm out. worked on that, right. And uh, that was also the time that we started thinking about spinning off the hypertext work because it was clear to me that there was a full agenda on graphics and there was a full agenda on hypertext. And <coughs> at that time I was investing a lot in, in uh, bitmap graphics workstation technology. Brown was the first university to really commit to the use of workstations for education. I was chairman of the department at that time. I was the founding chairman starting in 79. 
and uh, we had very ambitious plans for what uh, was later called the electronic classroom, which is an idea that Bob Sedgwick had had based on um, work done by another friend of mine, Ron Becker, on algorithm animation. And Bob, along with his PhD student and my undergraduate student, Mark Brown, built BALSA, Brown Algorithm Simulator and Animator, that let you see, let's say, sorting out, sorry, Ron Becker had done sorting out sorting as a movie. And Bob's idea was that with workstations running at a half MIP, which was huge at the time, and wonderful bitmap graphics that you could do all this in real time with user input. So he and Mark Brown designed this system, which I used in my introductory course, and Bob used in his data structure and algorithms course, where you could see code being stepped through, and right next to the code there was a window that showed you a drawing of the data structure and how it was being modified in real time. Um, that became the electronic workstation lab, the electronic classroom, and I competed against CMU and MIT to get a major investment from IBM. And we were called, when I was finally successful in negotiating that, uh, the three workstation schools, CMU, MIT, and Brown. Uh, and we had this electronic classroom at that time, which was a specially built ramped auditorium populated by 40 Apollo DN300s or maybe DN100s. I don't remember the model number. And no one had seen anything like that before. And we were using that live during these courses for teaching kids concepts. It was beautiful. So Norm was there at the time, as was Nicole Yankelovich and multiple other of my students. Once we got the IBM grant, it was clear that I couldn't do that with just my group of mostly undergraduates and a, and a couple of graduate students and no full-time people. So with Bill Shipp, who at that time was running computing at Brown, we came up, he, Norm, and I, with the idea of for, uh, forming IRIS, Institute for Research and Information and Scholarship. And it was IRIS that got the big $17 million equipment grant from IBM. Not just equipment, but staff as well to essentially bring 600 workstations to the Brown campus so that every faculty member would have a workstation. That was the vision. And there's a beautiful cover of the Brown Alumni Monthly in 84 that shows a mess of workstations coming in through the Van Winkle gates, like new students. I think I remember that. So that was the vision. It never came to pass because IBM was unable to make the hardware robust enough and the version of Unix never was robust enough. So after a while they were viewed as boat anchors and we never took delivery of the, the full set. And in fact, a lot of development at that time happened on Apple platform. We started with leases and eventually moved on to uh, other Apple products and were very influenced by uh, the object-oriented work that had gone on, on at Park. So that's a whole separate story that you will have gotten in great detail from Norm Meyerowitz. So, yeah, well, particularly yeah. intermediate. Yeah. So uh, I can't say that outside of having uh, exposed Norm to the three generations of hypermedia systems done under my direct supervision, uh, I won't make any intellectual claim on design ideas in uh, intermedia. I think that was primarily Norm and his people. I certainly critiqued and had suggestions, but uh, he deserves the credit for the architecture. Um, we can have a separate conversation on all the new ideas that Intermedia introduced into the hypermedia world. Um, st stepping back with the education thread, though, mm -hmm. you mentioned that FRES you did use in the classroom. FRES was used by a by lot of faculty members, but not in the classroom. What we did do in the mid 70s was to use it for courses, but in a lab because we only had one 
terminal that had the full power. It was a IMLAC, which was like an overgrown PDP-8, basically. And it had a large screen, which we divided in windows. It's a 76 movie in which we use the term windows. Hi. Uh, Early, that was a question. I forgot the windowing. When did that, didn't come into any of these early? Well, he, uh, Doug lays claim to the fact that he split the screen up into portions, which were forerunners of, of windows. We had more general windows. They were rectangular. You could have multiple ones of them. You could choose various scan configurations. Norm build a even more general window system than what we had for Fress that could be used for arbitrary applications. So we were very early in the, the movement to have windowing in the modern sense of being able to choose what size they were and having you know multiple arrangements of windows. We did not have tiled windows a la park because for a while we didn't have bitmap graphics workstations. The IMLAC was a vector display, but it was uh, uh, software characters, so you could make Greek fonts and Hebrew fonts and all kinds of other pretty stuff that we couldn't have done with the hardware character generators of the time. So you were in the, la in the lab with the So clock. we had a special room where we had this IMLAC terminal, which was hooked to the mainframe, and students would come in to do their work. So the first course in which we did this was Man, Energy, and Environment. And I got a grant from the Exxon Education Foundation to do that. And then the year after, I got a grant from NEH. I'm probably one of the very few, possibly the only computer scientist who ever got an NEH grant. I got it from Roger Rosenblatt, who later became a uh, quite well-known editor and opinion piece writer for I think he started off with Life and then went to Time Magazine. Uh, it was one of his many jobs. In any case, I convinced him that I, my collaboration with this great uh, English and semiotics teacher uh, should be funded and that we should run this experiment of doing a poetry course um, the with all was. the kids doing um, Oh, man, this is ridiculous. Bob Scholes. Uh, yes. You're going to have to edit this out. I cannot <laughs> be having a brain fart about a collaborator. Bob Scholes, uh, and there was a teacher of writing named Van Nostrand, who also was involved. and. Uh, there's a very nice documentary that we shot with NEH money on 16 millimeter film that I can get you a copy of sometime in which we describe the poetry experiment. But the, the beautiful thing there was that these kids in the, the Fress group, and there was also a control group that mimicked all the facilities of Fress, but they did it on paper, and then there was a standard group that went to the library and did things a completely normal way and we compared how they did and our group had fewer cavities by a statistically <laughs> significant amount. The thing that Bob Scholes loved is that they wrote something like three times more than the other kids did because writing was so easy if you had a computer system to help you do it. And as I mentioned in my uh, tribute to Doug yesterday. I believe we had the first scholarly online community, or uh, not the first online community because arguably the bootstrap uh, thing had been working with NLS as the network information center for the ARPANET for, uh, for years before then. But we were a genuine scholarly community where the whole idea was to uh, do interpretation of readings and do recursive commenting of those readings. And it was, a, it was a beautifully run experiment. So I'm very proud of that. Um, in any case, uh, that was still primarily text oriented with a little bit of line graphics thrown in. Then when we got the bitmap graphics displays, their ability to do color 
the graphics became sort of the, the principal focus in that system and then by intermediate time uh, Norm had this very object-oriented view of how documents should be indefinitely nested so you could have text within graphics within text and uh, I think video was in there as well um, and then there was a better balance between text and graphics. But the Navy project was that the first was that was very the, heavily right, graphics, graphics oriented so. because bitmap raster graphics was just coming into commercial realization at that point. So you had links from essentially icon to icon or image Yeah, image. from page to page and from object within a graphical page to an object in another graphical page. And sure, you could have textual explanations, but the text wasn't the focus. And there wasn't any outline structure, for example, a la NLS. And were you doing other graphics work that was not related Oh yeah, to absolutely. There was other graphics work going on. We were uh, heavily invested in learning how to do rendering, image synthesis, and building geometric modelers. And uh, for example, there was a, uh, what is called a, a CSG, constructive solid geometry system, which was mathematically quite sophisticated. When was that? Uh, that was in the mid-80s, and we did volumetric rendering. There was a early version of the marching cubes algorithm that we did, and arguably that was the first time that algorithm had been practiced, even though GE is associated with that algorithm because they published first. So there was a lot of work on, on geometric modeling and rendering for 3D graphics that was going on and we built animation systems, so sort of modern 3D graphics is something we were working on at the time. So starting in the 70s? Or? Mm, well, even in the 70s we were doing graphics because uh, the configuration that we did our graphics on was a homebrew multiprocessor, which we started in the 60s already, the late 60s. Uh, we built matrix multipliers so that we could do homogeneous coordinate transformations of initially 3D objects. Uh, Andy Markovitz, who became quite well known through uh, a, a book, I believe, called Take No Prisoners. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm spacing on this. Um, by Ferguson, I believe. It, it was a book describing how his company, funded by Matrix Partners, of which Andy Markovitz, who built my first Matrix multiplier, was now by that time a, a partner, how they eventually sold Front Page to Microsoft. And it talks about the whole story. And Markovitz does not come out as a particularly lovable character, but he's still a good friend of mine, and I think he was a bit maligned in that book. But never mind, I, I wasn't there, so I have no way of judging. In any case, it's interesting that Andy got his start building that matrix multiplier. He then was one of the key people at Apollo, and we were the first people to buy a lot of Apollos and use them for education. So. That was an interesting connection. And after that, we bought two microprogrammable metaphors, made one a CPU by providing its instruction set, and the other was a GPU. And we provided it with a special purpose graphics processing unit instruction set. We called it a DPU, display processing unit, but today everybody calls that a GPU. In any case, it had a very sophisticated instruction set, which we would customize, and these two machines shared 64K of memory, so it was a symmetric multiprocessor in some ways. And what and year? This was in the early 70s, and we had that attached to the mainframe, and we did experiments in migrating code in real time from the mainframe to this multiprocessor to do load balancing. 
and then we used a commercial 3D graphics engine called the Vector General, which had its own transformation hardware, but we had a microprogrammed unit, which was much more sophisticated and much faster and could do not only 3D transformations in real time, but also 4D, because we worked with a colleague of mine named Tom Banshoff in the math department who was very interested in four-dimensional geometry, hypercubes and other hypersurfaces in four space. But how would you render that? By doing 3D projections of 4D objects. And he became an expert in slicing and dicing through the uh, four-dimensional volumes to show what their three-dimensional projections look like. So in the way uh, of thinking about this, if you take a cube, you can slice it either like this, and you get squares, right? Or you can slice it on the diagonal, and you get triangles, and then hexa uh, hexagrams. Well, you certainly don't get a square cross-section. I have to think about that. Uh, I'm not that great at visualizing, which is why I've always been so profoundly attracted to graphics. In any case, he would slice. Uh, yeah, I'd have to draw it in order to see it. And he would do this for four-dimensional figures, and he would make movies with a PhD student of mine who graduated in the mid-60s, Charles Strauss. Banshoff and Strauss Productions and their movies were widely known in the mathematics community because they showed the slicing and dicing of, of four-dimensional figures. And that was all shot off our equipment. So that was a very sophisticated multiprocessor, and we did distributed computing. And in fact, I organized the world's first workshops on distributed computing and ran them at Brown and publish the proceedings because I had my students do real-time transcription of what everybody was talking about. So I was very uh, interested in all the systems aspects of graphics from the hardware on up and including distributed processing. We had a, uh, a remote procedure call mechanism that allowed us to have these heterogeneous machines talk to each other over the over the 50 KB link, and uh, uh, that was a very sophisticated system, and just like NLS shoehorned into 64K of memory with a one megabyte bladder, it was amazing what you could do in those days. <laughs> we have <laughs> um, gigabytes of memory and things don't move any faster than they did when we had megabytes or even kilobytes of memory. It's, it's, it's amazing. So yes, we were doing a lot of graphics from the ground up, uh, most of it 3D graphics. We're getting to the end of this, this tape. The um, SIGGRAPH, is there any other um, thread to follow there? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, we essentially created a forerunner of SIGGRAPH, but the credit should go to the people who put on the first conference at Bowling Green and then kept expanding the vision and kept getting more and more people to come and more equipment manufacturers to come and put on this amazing set of shows year after year after year. SIGGRAPH is a huge volunteer organization and uh, it's quite amazing at how well it works. And you had um, a story about Steve Jobs' reaction to networking. Or oh, right. Or? Yeah. So. Andy Hertzfeld was one of my students. He did a very nice final project in the introductory graphics course that used that multiprocessor system, which was called Bugs, Brown University Graphics System. And it was a spline editor where in real time you could adjust Bezier spline control points and uh, shape the curve. And I had not had much contact with Andy. And Andy, of course, was very active in the homebrew club and the whole West Coast personal computing phenomenon. And then one day I got a call, and I don't remember whether it was from him or from Steve directly, that they wanted to come to Brown. They knew about our very early on 
aggressive use of workstations for teaching and research. All the faculty at workstations and our freshmen had access to workstations, which is something that not even MIT and CMU had for quite a while. Uh, they knew about that and they wanted to tell us about a development that we might find interesting. And that turned out to be the Mac. And it was the early Mac, the 128K Mac, where you had to milk with the floppies. Didn't have a hard drive, no networking, no client-server architecture. So the provost had been invited to come see the demo and whatever it was and to have lunch with Steve Jobs, who already was a pretty well-known guy and we knew and really liked the Lisa a lot. So we were expecting something that would be the follow-on to the Lisa and would be bigger, better, faster, cheaper. And in some ways the Mac is, in some ways it isn't. But the fight that I got in with Steve in the provost's presence, and both he and I have tempers and they flared, was about Steve's vision of personal computing. Now, we had been doing personal computing, a person sitting down at a workstation, but not giving up anything because a la Park, the Apollo folks had implemented client-server architecture and they had a very good networking protocol. They had this object-oriented operating system called Domain, which was arguably well ahead of Unix, but eventually lost out to Unix. That's a separate thread. I can tell you more about that if you like. In any case, this was a really sophisticated system. And we were doing real-time graphics and text and the whole nine yards. And so I loved the Mac and its clean, crisp display and its real-time stuff, all done in clever software that Andy Hertzfeld and Bill Atkins, uh, who's a real wizard. They both are, but Bill is amazing. Uh, Bitblit and other more clever extensions of Bitblit. Um, so I, I thought it was terrific, but I said, so how do we connect these in a network? And Steve said, you don't. So I don't know whether we had the fight about the hard drive first or whether the networking fight came, but those were major points of disagreement. And Steve said, basically, no need for that. You're supposed to work by yourself. It's your personal computer, small enough and light enough that you can pack it in this case. They had one of those very early soft packs for the, for the Mac, and that was his vision. You have this nice, cute little machine, and you do your own personal work on it. And it was not part of his worldview that people should work together and that they should share expensive resources. He learned differently rather soon thereafter, fortunately for all of us. Well, thank you very much. My it's pleasure. An honor. Yeah, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So here's another thread, which is uh, graphic standards. In 71, I had my first sabbatical and took a whole bunch of my graphics group, all students, to my home country of the Netherlands. And we spent a very wonderful year in Nijmegen. In the, is in the southeast of the country. And we set up an instant graphics group there. And I taught both introductory computer science and computer graphics. And we got a very high end, state of the art PDP 1145 and a vector general display. And for a while, that was sort of the high end standard for research groups. And we proceeded to do a lot of programming. I was familiar at the time with a system called Geno, graphical input output, that had been done in the UK at the Cambridge Computer Aided Design Center. And it was kind of the Fortran idea of abstracting physical devices to become logical devices. Um, and I thought we could make Geno into a much more interactive kind of system that would deal with all kinds of peripherals, which uh, could include mice and joysticks and, and 
cursor control keys and it could run just like Gino did on a variety of platforms by abstracting out both the display surface and devices to become logical devices a la Fortran. And so with my students and forming alliances with Delft Technical University and with Cambridge Computer Aided Design Center, Peter Woodsford in particular, uh, and Peter Vainman in, uh, in Delft, we set out to design a system that came to be called the General Purpose Graphics System, GPGS. It was a device and platform independent system with logical devices and that includes both the interaction devices, which we uh, classified into five categories, and uh, the display surface itself. Um, GPGS had a scene graph, so it had an internal hierarchical data structure, which was certainly a descendant of the sketchpad hierarchical data structure. And uh, we published it, and we thought this really works pretty well on a variety of devices, including even storage tubes, which are not exactly real-time graphics displays. Uh, GPGS eventually became the standard of Scandinavia. <laughs> that was mm. very nice for computer-aided design, shipbuilding, and things like that. And in 74, I helped organize a, um, a program on the idea of standardizing graphics library at National Bureau of Standards that was run by a former student of mine named Ira Cotton, who had been my undergraduate student. And a bunch of people working in computer graphics converged there for a two-day meeting was it time to think about standards and graphics? How would we go about it? And MBS, National Bureau of Standards, was a natural host for that kind of thinking. In an evening birds of a feather session, I remember this vividly, some number of us, including former students of mine who worked on GPGS, like Dan Bergeron, who later became department chairman at UNH, and still to this day works in computer graphics. Um, we said, you know, we've learned enough about GPGS uh, that we think we can base a standard on it. That was again debated at a international workshop run by Richard Gedge in France, where Alan Kay and Nicholas Negroponte and Alan Newell, uh, not Alan Newell, Martin Newell, and some of his colleagues from the Cambridge group uh, came and uh, there were some of us who very much were in favor of trying to standardize and some people who were cynical or skeptical and Nigel Ponte and I had a very public disagreement about whether it was time to standardize he taking the negative and what, me taking the positive. What year? 76. At the conference? At okay. that workshop in Sayac, France. To cut to the chase, uh, Bert Herzog and an old friend with whom I had taught graphics in summer courses, who unfortunately passed away this past summer, and Bob Dunn, who had been a sponsor of mine at the same time that uh, the work was going on for ONR. So he was at the Army and was co-sponsoring some of the work on electronic documentation using hypermedia. Bob Dunn and, uh, and Bert Herzog convinced the uh, graphics establishment that there should be a standards effort endorsed by SIGGRAPH. And that became the, the Graphics Standard Planning Committee. And we, with a small group of people that met mostly at Brown University, uh, designed something called the core graphic system, which was based very largely on GPGS. The Germans took an early draft and under another dear friend, Jose Encarnasau's leadership, built a derivative that was 2D at first called GKS, which in German, Grafische Kernelsystem, means core, kernel core. So. It, it was misunderstood that these were competitive systems, and they certainly w diverged after a while, but they were based on 
the earlier core draft, which in turn was based on GPGS, which we did as a three university project with most of the work happening in my group in Nijmegen. Uh, we tried to get CORE to become the national and then the international standard. It had pretty good reception at first. Eventually it became an ISO standard. Uh, and then it actually morphed into something called FIGS programmers, Hierarchical intera Interactive Graphics System. And FIGS went through the ANSI process and the ISO process. And I learned that what we had been able to do at Brown in a year, essentially, as a Tiger team, meeting often and rapidly iterating our understanding of how to do this and not solving all of the world's problems by any means, but getting something done, we were able to present the design in 77 the SIGGRAPH conference in San Jose, where I got thrown in the swimming pool <laughs> by my friends who had worked on that committee. In any case... Is that uh, a positive or a negative? Well, it was a very mixed blessing because uh, I had my wallet in my pants still, mm -hmm. since I was completely unprepared for this little uh, bit of uh, good fellowship and had ruined pictures of my kids and my driver's license and some other things, but never mind. It was well meant. It was a good practical joke. In any case, I've almost forgiven them, as you can tell. <laughs> and what? 30 years. This was before Foley and Van Damme, the book. Uh, <coughs> so I then saw that informal standards can be done quickly by a small committee especially a committee in which there really weren't any commercial interests to speak of, that once you got involved in a formal standards process, it became heavyweight and you had people who represented what their companies would find useful and that was a lot harder work and I didn't have the stomach for it. Jim Metzner, one of my other early PhD students, bless his soul, participated in the official standards efforts, as did multiple other people who had worked on the original core project and uh, man they labored hard to try to get an international standard. But uh, at about that time SGI was starting to really become a force and they had a completely different idea about what a graphics library should look like and they controlled that graphics library and they became the dominant producer of high-end graphic systems and so GL and then OGL for Open GL eventually took over and it showed very clearly that a, a package designed by a small group and continuously refined by testing with a large customer base can win out over the political convergence process that is the standards process. And Camels, i.e. horses designed by committee. There are a lot of compromises that you have to make in order to get people to agree and people sometimes argue too narrowly for their companies or institutions' interests. And so effectively the uh, graphic standard never really became a commercial force to be reckoned with and OGL did and RenderMan did all packages designed by much smaller groups of people without the constraints of the political consensus process of official standards. So that was kind of a, uh, a negative thing, but on the other hand, we learned a lot from doing it and some of the ideas have survived. For example, Ingrid Karlbohm's uh, viewing pipeline survives uh, to this day and um, I was able, when I took a sabbatical working for Bill Paduska's third company, which was a graphic supercomputer company initially called Stellar, I reconvened a bunch of my old friends and some new uh, people, including folks from competing organizations, and we designed a extension to FIGS to bring it into the era of modern rendering, which was called FIGS Plus. And for a while, it looked like FIGS Plus would get traction that FIGS hadn't 
but it never was able to stand up to OGL. And that's fine. Uh, certainly differences in design philosophy, and uh, interestingly enough, FIGS and FIGS Plus had built-in scene graphs because they were variations on core, much more sophisticated than core. Core was a more sophisticated version of GPGS, which had had scene graph. And OGL, although initially in GL there was a scene graph, that has faded completely. But game engines all have scene graphs. And this old religious dispute about should you or shouldn't you have a scene graph just keeps going around and around. There's a wonderful paper by Myers and Sutherland called The Wheel of Reincarnation about how the same old ideas come around and around and just have different implementations. Uh, that certainly is the case for graphics libraries and graphics standards and uh, scene graphs are healthy and alive and uh, some people like them and they're useful and some people don't like them and want immediate mode. So that will be a continuing battle and people should have choices. But is some of the way things come around due to what well, you talked about some the other night around the Engelbard uh, anniversary that there's very little education in, um, about the past in computer science? Yeah, you make a very good point. Uh, certainly things are rediscovered and people don't read any of the old papers and don't know that some of the ideas are 30, 40 years old and that there were trade-off analyses about how things might be done and the pros and cons of the different approaches and they reinvent and sometimes what they reinvent is arguably better than what was there before and sometimes it isn't. So um, this is not a, uh, a culture in our computer science community that prizes a lot of reading of the past. And that is definitely uh, one of the things that is, is wrong with what we do. We're so hyperactive and so focused on making improvements and trying to do it on the Moore's Law time scale or faster, preferably. Certainly in graphics, way faster than Moore's Law. New results every six months in the uh, GPU industry and, and at SIGGRAPH. There is huge progress from year to year. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there's bound to be some rediscovery, but I, I think in all fairness to the people who are making the advances, most of it is new thinking and taking advantage of new capabilities and the field is, is thriving and having amazing success. A couple of miscellaneous questions. When, when you saw the, the Engelbart demo, you were working on similar things. Yes, very much did so. That, was there any kind of, did you feel disappointed in any way that something was so developed in what you thought was a new field? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, I was the, the country mouse <laughs> and I went to the big city, and as I mentioned yesterday, here I was working with a team of three undergraduates working part-time, and there Doug was with his far more developed system philosophy and system built from the ground up with 17 people and this amazing projector and a link to a remote site. It was mind-blowing, and I'm not ashamed to say I was very skeptical, uh, skeptical of how much of it was real and how much of it was demoware, whether this was really a production system or whether they had been very lucky in cobbling something together. And it wasn't until I spent time on site that I realized that, yes, this was a very deep vision and not just some showmanship. The showmanship was magnificent, by the way. Uh, and I had to have profound respect for it, but it, it's, I guess, uh, equivalent in the sports world, you're really proud of yourself for having run an under six minute mile, and then you go see somebody who's doing it 
an under four minute mile and you say, what was I thinking? What, what was I doing? What right did I have to be proud of what I'd accomplished? So imitation is the sincerest form of flattery and I imitated what I thought were the best features of uh, Engelbart's functionality in NLS and in Fress. So we copied a lot of the ideas, even though we implemented them in a different way, and uh, also kept some of our uh, old ideas from the, the first system. And did you ever have moments like that in graphics? Oh, you, you always have moments in, in any field where you see yourself lapped by somebody you didn't even know about, and somebody who came out of left field was doing something that they hadn't published before, and you look at it and you say, wow, that's really cool. I wish I'd thought of it. But I think we did enough things that were novel uh, over the last three, four decades that I feel okay with occasionally being lapped. That's it's all part of the game. And um, when did networking, when did you add networking to your own hypertext systems? We never had networking as an explicit component. Um, but you had time sharing sort of things from earlier. We had time sharing uh, in the sense that, uh, just like with Engelbart, we had a monitor that allowed multiple relatively underpowered, underpowered glass teletypes and somewhat fancier uh, stations to be hooked to a single mainframe. But that was not networking. Okay. We, we certainly made use of virtual machine technology that IBM had available as early as 67 because we bought uh, 360, 67 at Brown. And in fact, one of the things I'm, I'm really proud of that was a, a tiny fraction of the mother of all demos is that in 68 or 69 in Boston, we had uh, the hypertext editing system running on a 2250 Model 4 over a bisync link to a mainframe in Cambridge using an early version of their virtual machine operating system, which was called CPCMS. So we were very early adopters of virtual machine technology courtesy of, of uh, Cambridge and that center too disappeared but the idea certainly didn't and everybody now uses virtual machine simulators but uh, IBM invented all that in, in Cambridge in the, in the 60s. So we, we had minimal networking in the sense that we used this high-speed bisync link and the IMLAC ran over 1200 baud modem but it's not networking in the modern internet sense of networking. That didn't exist. That had to wait for the ARPANET and NSFNet and the development of modern networking. And by that time, I'd stopped working effectively on, uh, on, on research systems. And in 90, uh, was one of the founders of Electronic Book Technologies, which was the first company that unified the idea of declarative markup uh, through SGML, which uh, and that's a whole separate and long story. SGML is what XML is getting back to, infinitely more sophisticated than a particular tag set, which is HTML. In any case, it unified declarative markup for documents with hypertext ideas, and so it was uh, based on all of the hypertext systems, including Intermedia, that we had developed at Brown, and it was sold commercially, and the company lasted for about 10 years. And that was a really neat set of people and, and technical achievements. And what, when you look around today, how different is it from what you imagined back at the, the Oh, dawn? that's a good leading question. Back in... Uh, in the NLS, mother of all demos days, none of us, except possibly for Doug, anticipated the sort of worldwide access that we have today. Ted? I don't think Ted anticipated worldwide access. I think uh, 
later he probably did, but in the beginning we didn't talk about that because there was no existence proof that that could be done. The whole idea of packet switching only came on in the, in the late 60s. So we were contemporaneous with early networking ideas and packet switching, but we, we certainly didn't have a, uh, an ARPANET connection and get used to that kind of thinking. So I think the idea of having everybody in the world have instantaneous access to information, uh, that would have been pretty science fiction-y. And the idea of a real dyna book of the type we all carry as laptops, or better yet, tablet PCs, that was pretty far away. When I heard Alan Kay talk about Flex and dyna book, I thought, yeah, 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 it would be lovely. But we were still in the mainframe area, and many computers were just starting to be common, and that was a huge improvement. But to go from there to microcomputers and then from there to laptops, well, that was a stretch. Although I have a lovely plastic mock-up in my office of a maintenance and repair technician's toolkit of the future, which is in effect, it's this big, it's a color screen. It was meant to be touch screen. And it would run that electronic document system that we talked about earlier. And that the, the idea would be that you had all of that power in that portable form factor, and that was mocked up in 1984. A tablet sort of? Yeah, form sort of like a large color tablet. And, Network? Uh, wireless? Oh, we didn't worry okay. about the networking. We figured something like that would come along. But, you know, it had a slot for all mocked up. This was done by an industrial design student at Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, but we thought about, you know, little, what you know, would now call a flash drive or a thumb drive. And uh, the idea was that it would be screen-centric and that you, instead of typing, you would point and click. That was fully thought out. So at some point we woke up to what was happening with personal computing and raster graphics and saw that this was all going to be possible at some point. But in the 60s, no way. Not me, for sure. Doug, who knows? Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. It's been a pleasure and an honor.